can have everyone uh, go ahead and please take a seat. Just a reminder, if you did not get a parking pass, make sure that uh, you did get a parking pass because the parking police will give you a ticket. It's $50 if you don't have a parking pass for the evening. So uh, especially for people from the outside because uh, last, last time we had a couple people that didn't pick them up and got a ticket. So we don't want that to happen. We have free tickets for you, free parking passes. So if you need that, please make sure that you, you take that. Go ahead and have a seat. You can, wherever you want to. Sit. Are we waiting for you? <laughs> so good evening everyone on behalf of the Armenian Studies Program. Welcome to um, another one of our fall lecture series. Uh, this is one that I'm looking forward to in particular because the topic is one that is something that is touching on many of the courses that we teach here at Fresno State. Uh, as you see on the, uh, as you see on the PowerPoint that we have, uh, I'm going to be starting a radio show on uh, a radio hour on Sundays from 2 to 3 p.m. So if you're interested in listening in, it's a multicultural show station on 1600 a.m. And I'll be featuring guests, a uh, variety of guests, people call in uh, just to kind of give people here in the community something more to hear from the Armenians. So I would welcome your participation by listening and calling in. In the next uh, couple of weeks, we have two more uh, upcoming events to conclude our fall lecture series. On Friday, November the 8th, we're going to have a visit from Dr. Umit Kurt, who has been here before as a Kazan visiting professor. And he's going to give a talk on how the Young Turks, uh, from the very beginning, the Committee of Union and Progress, embodied racism in their construction of who they were and their identity. That's going to be uh, one week from this Friday, November the 8th, right here in this hall. And then on November the 19th, which is a Tuesday night, uh, the Armenian Studies Program will be presenting its reflections from the student trip to Armenia, which took place this last summer, uh, which myself and Professor Laporta led. We had 14 students, and we will have some of the students talking about their trip. We have some videos and some pictures to report back to you about the experiences they had in Armenia. So that's our upcoming events. Uh, and then way looking forward into March, we have our 32nd annual banquet. <coughs> And that's something that's always um, very popular, and we hope to see you there as well. Tonight, we have a special presentation by Aisha Nur Korklas. She's from the University of Amsterdam. Her talk is called No Place Like Home, Yergid and the Ex-Ottoman Armenians in Soviet Armenia. And it's going to explore the, the path and the journey of Armenians who survived the genocide, moved into the Russian area of Armenia, Russian Armenia, and then over the period of the next few decades, uh, adjusted to their life in Soviet Armenia, in communist Armenia. And she will reflect on the different phases of those refugees who went to Soviet Armenia and how they were received and how they saw their own homeland, the Yagir, uh, in that context. So that's gonna be uh, what her talk will be about. Uh, she, Aisha Nurkorkmaz, is a PhD researcher, as I said, at the University of Amsterdam. And she had received her master's degree at the Central University, European University. And her main areas of interest are the late Ottoman Empire, Soviet Armenia, as well as anthropological concepts of homeland, sacralization, and materiality. I had the opportunity to um, meet and talk with Aisha Nur over the, the last couple of days. Uh, she's a very interesting person because of her interest, how she got interested in Armenian studies or a study of the Armenians. Uh, and she has uh, learned Armenian fluently and has spent eight months in Armenia uh, interviewing those refugees, families, their descendants, and how they see their, uh, their own background. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome today um, Aisha Nur Korkmaz to present our lecture entitled, once again, No Place Like Home, Yergid and the Ex-Ottoman Armenians in Soviet Armenia. Aisha Nur, welcome.
here. Um, today I will take you to the world of Soviet Armenia and the aftermath of the Armenian Genocide. I will talk about the sense of rootedness and spatial belonging among a large population of Ottoman Armenian refugees who fled their homes in the Ottoman Empire and arrived in Tsarist Russia in search of safety uh, from the massacres and mass deportations in 1915-1916. Let me begin with a brief historical background uh, to the refugee displacement uh, from the Ottoman East particularly. Between 1915 and 1918, around uh, 300,000 Armenians had fled uh, from what we call from Eastern Anatolia to uh, the South Caucasus to evade the deportations and the violence that was ordered by the Committee of Union and Progress. The majority of them were from Kars, Ardahan, Erzurum, Malazgirt, Van, Mush, Bitlis, um, Sasun, um, and a few uh, communities from Urfa and Tigranagir. Um, after an artist's journey uh, through the Ottoman and Russian battle zones during the, uh, the war, um, the starvation, the epidemics on the refugee route, they uh, reached safety in the Russian territory. These are the three uh, routes that you see over there, three, four routes, um, are the most used um, refugee routes. Uh, most of the uh, Ar Ottoman Armenians escaped uh, through these routes and ended up in camps in Yerevan, Tiflis, Alexandropol at that time, Yumri today, Echmiadzin and uh, Nakhchivan. They were waiting to be repatriated to their hometowns in Anatolia, but their dreams uh, soon disappeared as the next years um, saw significant events that rendered that return impossible. Let me give a brief summary of that. In 1917, the Tsarist Empire collapsed following protests. And then a year later, the Ottoman Empire capitulated, signing the Mudros um, Armistice. And then on the same year, the Democratic Republic of Armenia was established, which that didn't take uh, long. In 1920, the Bolsheviks took over and incorporated it into the, um, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And then in uh, 21, the Bolsheviks also established an alliance with the Turkish nationalists led by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk uh, signing the Treaty of Moscow, which somehow settled the Russian and Turkish uh, border question. And it also acknowledged the Turkish authority in Anatolia um, and therefore hindered the refugee repatriation uh, back to Ottoman East, Turkish East. Finally, the year 1923 saw the establishment uh, of the Turkish Republic officially, um, which then forever uh, determined the fate of Ottoman Armenian refugees in Transcaucasia, precluding their return and finalizing their expulsion from uh, Eastern Anatolia. The ex-Ottoman Armenians' new homeland then became Soviet Armenia, a country that was being politically and economically transformed at full speed. Shortly after being established, the Soviet government endorsed Armenia as the homeland of our, all Armenians. They started repatriating, for example, uh, around 20,000 Armenian refugees from Iran, uh, Turkey, Greece, Syria, uh, between the years of 1921 and 1925. And in this abrupt climate, uh, changing climate, um, Vladimir Lenin died in 1924. Um, leaving his place to Joseph Stalin, uh, which then uh, became the sole leader of the USSR. He quickly changed 
economic policies of the USSR uh, launched a massive collectivization program called Kolkhoz. Um, and, and this program compelled refugees and everyone else, of course, to give up their private fields, their land and livestock to join these collective farms. And we saw an interesting development in 1929. Uh, some of the uh, Armenian refugees from the Ottoman Empire, along with Russian Armenians and uh, Azeris and some Kurds, they staged protests in uh, an area called Tallinn. I don't know if you can, you can't really see it here, um, but it's basically close to Mount Alagos. They together staged the protest. Uh, they slaughtered their animals, not to give them up to the Soviet state, which then, maybe two decades later, a decade later, came back to them, um, cost them dear. But before going into that, let me elaborate a little bit how Soviet Armenia was conceived and, and how the refugees react uh, to this creation. I want to clarify one thing before actually, because uh, there is a misconception that all of the Ottoman Armenian refugees were against the idea of the Bolsheviks being in charge. Um, certainly the Sovietization of Armenia had caused resentment and alienation among some refugees, some communities. Um, most of them were sympathetic to the Eret, the Dashnak Tsun party, but they did not represent the whole Armenian refugee population. There were some refugee communities that come to believe that the Eret failed them, aim at misery, disease, starvation, whatever happened in that democratic Republican period. And then they believed that the Bolshevik leadership could bring more stability to their lives economically. And besides this, there were the socialist Armenians, the socialist Armenian refugees who from the get-go joined the Communist Party. Um, and they acted as politicians, writers, educators um, in the aftermath of the genocide. This of course changed. When Stalin came to power, everyone had to be a member of the Communist Party, uh, the Bolshevik Party. There, there was no question of choice. We also have to keep that in mind. But nevertheless, irrespective of their political persuasion, a complicated process of adaptation to Soviet Armenia was common to all of them, common to all of the refugees. Living under a new political order necessitated a total transformation of these ex-Ottoman subjects into allegiant Soviet citizens. They had to learn Russian, for instance. They had to adapt to Eastern Armenian dialect. They had to accommodate their understandings to the new cultural norms and socioeconomic practices of the Soviet Union. They also felt somehow estranged from the new realities having brought with them their own political and cultural and economic understandings. They had to come to terms with the ideological restrictions imposed particularly by the Stalinist regime and reappraise their religious, national, and economic understandings. And among themselves, for a decade or two at least, they maintained a separate identity a separate communal belonging based on their dispersion experience. They emphasized that distinctness from the Russian Armenian locals by naming themselves after their former hometowns. For instance, if they're coming from Mush, they would just call themselves Mushetsi. If they're from Van, they'll call themselves Vanetsi. If they're from Sasun, they'll call themselves Sasunsi. Not at the town that they are residing at that moment. And they also continued speaking in their own dialects. Um, they practiced village endogamy. By that I mean they would marry the Hamagyulatsi. So 
if they're coming from Vaughn, they, they would want to marry, they would want to give their daughters to a Vaughnutsi. It's pretty much actually similar to how the diaspora communities acted. You could draw some similarities here. I take these as signs of distrust to outsiders and trust to, to their solidarity groups. Um, and of course, let's not forget some of them lived in um, camps and settlements um, with their own groups, their, their own uh, basically regional, local uh, people. Some of them chose to live near the Soviet Turkish border, which is basically from Shirak to Ararat, um, Mars, and um, because they considered somehow that they were going to get back eventually, um, and being close to the border made sense. Others found similarities between landscapes. So wherever that was similar to their village, to their village landscape, they chose to settle there. Often we see that with Sasuti. Um, they settle around Tallinn region. Uh, if you look at it, it looks very much like Sasuti. And some communities established new villages, and they named them after their cities or towns of origin. One of them is um, Nor Alakir in, in 1925. This one um, was built by the money of the diaspora with the funds that were collected from the diaspora mostly. Uh, and it was the first among all of these uh, villages. And among others, of course, there's Nor Sebastian, Nor Kharpet, Nor Malatya, and so on. And they come in the 30s and the 40s, they're being established, uh, mostly around uh, the city of Yerevan. They're villages at that time. Yerevan is, was not very uh, much populated. Um, but then as the city grew bigger and bigger with the Soviet industrialization, they became neighborhoods. So by the 30s, the refugees understood that they're deprived of the possibility of a return to Anatolia. And they found themselves in the grip of an intense exilic nostalgia for their hometowns. They often referred to these hometowns with one name, and that was Ergir or Diergir which means the country in Armenian. Uh, it's a combination of soil and water, if I'm not mistaken, the um, origin, the etymology of the word. And this, this concept is a spatial concept. It connotes an attachment that is somehow symbolic to Armenian homeland, or a local homeland. It could be your village. It could be your <coughs> ancestral home. It could be your actual uh, affective home um, in the Ottoman East that you are displaced from. And maybe just to give you some analogies uh, from non-Armenian studies, um, similar terms were created in Germany, for instance, Heimat. Um, it means, it can mean German homeland, it can mean a German village, or in Turkish there's this word memleket, it can mean Turkey, or it can mean your house in Malatya. Uh, Kurdish language has the same understanding. Uh, the word velat, for instance, can be uh, a whole symbolic idea of a Kurdish homeland. It can be your home. So it's, it, has a, it has a terminological flexibility that allows twofold categorization of Armenian homeland, and that is national level and then the local level. The national level of Ergir actually emerged in the 19th century. It was a political term um, that the nationalist and religious scholars in the Ottoman Empire had developed. They had the motto of Tebi Ergir. 
and that translates to, to war to the country. Um, scholars like Khrimian Haidik or uh, Nerses Vajra Petyan, they stimulated the interests of young Armenians in the Ottoman Empire before the genocide and to the political future of Western Armenia or an Armenia or a Hayastan basically. Um, around the time of the genocide, this concept, uh, though it was not very much used in political sense, it didn't really come to um, the table when it was negotiated uh, by Armenian politicians and Turkish politicians, um, it was there by an understanding. Evgir is the place where Ottoman Armenians had lived for generations, for centuries, and they still did up until being displaced. So that was the main idea. But when Eastern Anatolia, or that Evgir, whatever that is, became officially a part of the newly established Turkish Republic, the understanding of the term shifted from a political goal to a somehow lost dream. In the diaspora, there were lots of uh, writers who wrote about their home hometowns. Um, and they mostly talked about it from childhood mem memories and everything. Um, and in the meantime, in Soviet Armenia, actually similar discussions were going on. Evgir became a local homeland because it was only allowed to be a local homeland. It was not possible to operate in a Bolshevik system and argue that Evgir was a political goal of Armenian homeland. So somehow we s spot in the uh, writings and speeches of politicians and intellectuals uh, that Evgir is their home. So whoever is talking about Evgir is talking about Van or another region separately. So they would simply talk about, let's say, Vaspurakani Evgir for Van, Sasun, Sasna Evgir for Sasun, Mushra Evgir for Mush, etc. So let me get to this question of how the refugees whose lives straddled the world of the Ottoman Empire and then Soviet Armenia, how did they conceptualize it? We know that they have conceptualized it in a local sense, but how does that, how, how is that attached to dealing with loss and displacement in the uh, post-genocide period? And of course, the the term also changed the uh, the political arena. Did not allow it. It receded into the background, and then uh, mostly in the twenties, we see it as a local uh, local homeland that a lot of writers reflect on. Um, and they, in the twenties and thirties, they express uh, yearning, and somehow. Um, they try to assuage that desire for homecoming with a handful of soil. They talk about a handful of soil from the shores of uh, Ararat Mountain, the foothills of Ararat uh, Mountain, which even that by the, um, the Soviet Armenian leadership, the Bolshevik Armenian leadership, uh, was considered as a bourgeois, um, a patriotic bourgeois sentimentality. Throughout the 20s and 30s, um, the theme of Evgir flourished in literary rep representations. We see several folk songs, poems, novels, um, childhood memoirs uh, that were composed or written by Ottoman Armenian refugees. Uh, they mostly express grief, uh, as I told you, uh, over the displacement of um, and disp uh, dispossession and, and simply the non-return. I'll have you listen one example of these uh, cultural products. Um, it's a folk song named uh, Kalelal, uh, Let's Go My Son, for those who don't know Armenian. Um, it originates from the city of Tallinn. Uh, it was disputedly, um, not for sure, it was disputedly composed by an Armenian refugee from uh, Sasun in the early 30s. 
And it's a very popular song even today. You'll uh, encounter it. Um, it's recreated multiple times. You'll encounter it in everyday occurrences uh, in Armenia, such as drinking get-togethers and weddings and other ceremonies. Let's listen to it first. Uh, it's just a couple of minutes, and then I'll uh, explain what the lyrics are about. Um, he found refuge um, 
first in Tiflis in one of the orphanages, and then for 10 years, he had to go from one orphanage to another. He says he uh, traversed around nine or 10 orphanages. He wrote several poems about his former home and his lost family. Uh, one of them um, I find very touching. Uh, it's De Pitum. Um, he describes his pain and bitter feelings about being in exile. It goes like this. Life's joyful laughter that numbed my heart heard sounded like a death scream moving over me. But do you know what my worn mind had said to me? Is it possible to run away and go back home? There are others as well, other refugee writers who wistfully recalled their childhood years. Um, one of them was uh, Bahan Toto Benz, uh, another uh, Zabelia Sayam. Uh, of course, we're gonna talk about Kuken Mahari. Um, Toto Benz wrote uh, the famous Life on the Old Roman Road. Um, Yegishe Charens wrote about cars in uh, Elkir Nairi. Um, Zabel Yeseyan uh, wrote about uh, Üsküdar, the gardens of Silihdar. Um, and all of these productions have found favor quickly in, this, uh, in the 30s in Soviet Armenia. Um, they basically portray a small, intimate world revolving around their childhood rather than a national or a political homeland. They're very careful portraying Elgir uh, in that sense. So they, what they do is that they describe home, the garden, the room, uh, the street, the neighborhood, uh, or a farm field where uh, Armenian uh, lovers uh, were kissing each other. Um, daily life, um, local traditions, and then a rich tapestry of social relations and conflicts, of course. Um, there were lots of conflicts that are not, um, there, that, are, that were sporadic, that were not uh, politically oriented always, uh, other than the Hamidian massacres, of course. But they sometimes talk about that too. Um, so they self-censor themselves. They self-censor. Um, and they also talk about friends, neighbors, and childhood lovers, um, some of whom they lost during the genocide. Um, and the loss of those social networks means a part of the loss of the Edgir. Bahan Tota Benz has uh, a beautiful excerpt uh, in his memoir. Uh, he was born in Mezle, Kharpet, in um, 1889. And uh, he paid tribute to uh, his maternal cousin uh, in his memoir because he w she was abducted and she was Islamized by an Arab uh, tribal leader during the forced ma marches to the Syrian desert. And he wrote, they took her to the Arab deserts. I heard, I heard with great pain that they tattooed her sun-like forehead and che cheek, sister, I bow my head before your terrible destiny. Please accept your brother's tears. As Vahan's social networks and home uh, turned into a space of imagination and desire that were simply unattainable, he found himself in the grip of fantasy. It was cast on, cast as a reaction to, to his loss. So he started in um, 1933 uh, to write a novel, uh, a novel that would cast him as back to Harpet, to Mezre, to his home. Um, and, and he had the um, esquisse, the outline of this, um, around 30, 40 pages. He couldn't finish writing it. But um, the whole outline actually shows that um, he wouldn't find anyone alive in Mezre when he would get back, but his friend, his good friend's dog, Bella. So he would just have conversations with Bella in Mezre um, about his loss. And um, he couldn't finish this. In a similar way, um, Kurken Mahari writes about Vaughn, 
his birthplace. And um, he imagines a conversation with um, the city of Bonn. And uh, I'll read it here. Um, the city that I wrote about and where I spent my childhood comes to my mind often, too often, with its foggy lines and smiles. Apparently, it wants to talk, it asks me. Do you remember me? I reply, I do. I remember, not because there is no more beautiful city than you in this world. Oh, there are. I remember you because you are the only city that my unique childhood passed, and that child with curly hair beautified you. This city asks again, where is your grandmother, whom you used to call mom? She used to tell you the story of Zembilfrosh. She disappeared on the migration route, I respond. The Gahbakam, basically the refugee route. After her, whenever I see old beggar women, I stop for a minute and look at them carefully. Did my grandmother survive? Maybe she lost hope in finding us and became a beggar. Where is she? We're finished, I'm saying. This much is enough for you. I put a dot on our talk. I want to get up, but the city tells me with a bitter sarcasm, you cannot get rid of me. Childhood is the most radiant part of human life. How naive you must be to think that you put it behind you. So this, to me, sheds light on the ex-Ottoman Armenians' conceptualization of home, the way they deal with the loss in the 20s, is telling me that they are yearning for the irrevocably lost homeland while living in an actualized homeland, Soviet Armenia. In the next decades, the theme of the Ergir largely disappears uh, from refugee narratives due to a climate of fear and political persecutions in Soviet Armenia. This is, of course, Stalin's period. Uh, in the era between uh, 36 and 38, but of course it goes down to the 50s, uh, people like Totovets, Mahari, hundreds of refugee writers, intellectuals, uh, politicians like Khanjian, um, and also ordinary refugee victims. Refugees, they fell victim to the uh, purges. Um, in general, in Soviet Armenia, there were 42,000 uh, of uh, victims, basically. We don't know the uh, precise numbers of ex-Ottoman Armenians. Um, the numbers are very much debated. But a lot of scholars uh, estimate that they, as a group, constituted a larger majority uh, over the local Russian Armenians because they had many more reasons to be persecuted. Um, the Stalin's regime was particularly suspicious uh, about them because uh, they came from an empire where land ownership was okay. It was permitted, it was encouraged, so they had that mindset, that understanding. Um, and, and leftism, socialism was not very well developed in the Ottoman Empire. Um, so there's, remember the resistance uh, that happened the, the previous decades, um, basically cost them dear, the collectivization uh, protests um, that somehow increased Stalin's suspicions. Second, there were um, Dashnak party members, or people who were related to Dashnak party members, uh, or former militias, Fedai families. Um, they fought, along with the Tsar uh, and his army, against the Ottomans. Uh, that was considered a suspicious uh, behavior. And then the third, uh, they had contacts outside the USSR, naturally, because they, uh, their families had been dispersed. Um, and also some populations were living around the border. Armenia was the border, it was one of the borders of the USSR, so uh, it automatically made the region suspicious. So 
because of these suspicions, these 42,000 um, Armenians uh, were denounced and their activities somehow were de portrayed as manifestation of Armenian nationalism. Um, Norenz, whom I read uh, uh, the, the poem from, um, he was arrested in 36 on the grounds that he was a nostalgic nationalist because he glorified the Armenian resistance against the Ottoman state and um, he named his daughter after his former uh, home, hometown. Uh, he named his daughter Sasunik and so that was the reason uh, why he was a nationalist. Um, and after this, and basically after Totovens gets arrested, Norenz gets uh, arrested, a bunch of other intellectuals like Mahari, Led Kamsar, Yegishe Charens, uh, Bahram Alazam, who's from Bonn, Zabel Yeseyam, uh, and then uh, Gurgen uh, Van Andesi, and dozens more, they were um, basically uh, arrested. Some of them were shot dead. Uh, some of them were sent to uh, prison. Some of them were exiled to Siberia. And so in an environment like this, the concept of Ergir completely disappeared from literary works. Uh, people refrained from, from them because simply they were controversial. And so the terror, the Stalinist terror in Soviet Armenia marked a new phase in the lives of the ex-Ottoman Armenians. Um, because they displaced, they experienced a double displacement, a second displacement, a victimization over 20 years. It shaped their integration process into the new homeland as well, uh, much as it affected their self conceptions um, and their attachments, their spatial attachments and political expressions. It contributed simply to my understanding to the strengthening of the refugees' um, affiliation with Ergir, with the old home. Um, and it hampered their efforts to swiftly take root uh, in, in Armenia. And then comes the post-Stalin period, which is the 50s. Um, even though the Stalinist regime had achieved to silence the uh, writings or basically mentioning uh, of um, the Ottoman life, uh, the genocide, the massacres, or simply Ergir, uh, it has unintendedly laid the groundwork for a new period to come up in which the narratives about Ergir had boomed in popularity. This, uh, took some time, of course. Um, the period of Khrushchev, um, referred to as the thaw, um, it, it gave some relative relaxation uh, from the previous pressures and attempts. Uh, it somehow attempted to dissociate the Soviet states from the purges, the Stalinist purges. Uh, between um, 54 and 56, uh, some of the victims of Stalinism in Soviet Armenia, they were rehabilitated, so they could come back to Armenia. Um, they could live uh, in Yerevan, uh, rather than being exiled. Um, and we also see a renewed interest, not immediately in the 50s, starting from the 60s, we see a renewed interest in the theme of Ergir. Um, and Poems, novels, memoirs again appear uh, in the literature. Among them, um, there are Ottoman Armenians who were children by the time of the genocide and who self censored themselves, who self censored uh, during the time of Stalin, and uh, or their kids. So basically, second generation started writing about their uh, paternal village. Uh, about their memories of their fathers. Hracha Kochar is a good example. Uh, you might remember him from the famous novel Garot. Um, it also has been uh, a film later on, I think. Um, he writes about his town, Diadi. Um, 
and Khachik Dashtens writes uh, the Ranch Bernerikanche, which is a, one of the signature novels of the period of the uh, 80s. Uh, and then Mushak Galshoyan, who uh, is a second generation um, Armenian uh, survivor, I would say. He writes several short novels about uh, Sakhtun, particularly because his father was from there. Um, and then we also see interest um, of Armenian intellectuals who don't have background in the Ottoman uh, Empire. Uh, Balur Sebak is one of them, and Gevorgen uh, is another. And this era brought a new dimension, I would say, to the conceptualization of it. The, the, the portrayal of the Ottoman Armenians expulsion in 1915-1916, and the Stalinist terror, basically their victimization under the Stalinist terror, were somehow entangled trajectories of victimization. They reflected on both uh, in the second period of uh, Ergir-related uh, memoirs and, and uh, poems and short stories. Uh, they um, went into comparisons between the genocide, the massacres that they had seen, the refugee uh, routes uh, they had to experience, and the gulag camps and exile to Siberia. An example would be uh, Ler Kamsar. Uh, he's from Bonn. He was uh, fairly old, actually, when the genocide happened. And um, he would resist the censorship uh, around the time of the purges. He would just... Um, try to negotiate the newspaper editors by uh, changing certain words, uh, befriending them, and trying to publish um, his works that were about the Ottoman period. So up until 30s, we see Lev Kamsar publishing. Somehow he evades all of these uh, political persecutions up until uh, 37. And he experiences 20 years in the gulag camps. He experiences labor, um, forced labor. And uh, he, he makes this comparison uh, between that camp and the expulsion from Bonn. Um, and he portrays it as the most, two most harrowing experiences of his life. He says, I have seen two hard days in life. One of them was the day we were forced out of our homeland, leaving our homes, ancestral graves, and anything else we liked to the Turks. My life's second unfortunate day was when two Czechists came to search my house, separate me from my wife and three dear kids, and put me behind bars. I was deprived of the two most essential things to live, homeland and liberty. Mahadi also makes a similar comparison in his uh, Barbed Wires in Blossom, me a memoir he published after his um, uh, Stalinist purge experience. He expresses grief over the way that the catastrophe of the past, the catastrophe of the genocide unfolded in his present. And he somehow converges the two separate traumatic events into one victimization. And he writes, I quenched my longing for the rivers of my birthplace from Hurazdan, my longing from Van, for Van from Yerevan. And they thought it was too much. They deprived me of that. They made me a criminal in one night and locked me in a prison cell. I'd like to conclude here and somehow summarize what I tried to explore. The, the ex-Ottoman Armenians who fled their hometowns in 1915-1916 developed a differential spatial identity around Yergir, around the concept of Yergir. Um, and their imaginations in Soviet Armenia evolved. And I argued that they imagined and conceptualized Ergir, not only concerning their expulsion during the genocide, but also the socio-political factors, the traumatic events that greatly influenced them in the aftermath of the genocide. 
mostly stones, period. So we see then the um, appearance of Yeviv in Armenian literature in the 20s and 30s, mostly in forms of um, yearning for homecoming, um, explanations, uh, remembrances of, of home, um, and then the displacement and the trauma, the loss of homeland during the genocide. And then during the Stalinist period, we see that the, the theme completely disappears from Armenian literature up until the 60s, um, basically when the fear and censorship and political crackdowns and killings are lifted, uh, they disappear. Um, the theme of, of Yevgil makes a comeback. And it marks a phase in the imagination and the conceptualization of Yevgil, in which the traumatic experiences of the genocide itself and the Stalinist purges have been somehow enmeshed into one big perpetuated tragedy of the Armenian nation, crystallizing their experiences with the displacement, violence, victimization, and nostalgia. Thank you very much for listening. reminds me, again, uh, the Armenian experience in America, uh, when the first writers were also writing about that nostalgia. So that first generation of writers to America, and the first generation, of course, was looking back to their concept of Yergir, and it remained in the compatriotic unions, which were formed throughout the United States, where Armenians got together according to where they came from. Let's open it up for questions. If you have uh, specific questions, uh, Mr. Avkarian. Yes. would come. Um, I actually wanted to give uh, like a brief uh, presentation of who I am for coming here because I'm not a, a well-known scholar yet. I'm a PhD researcher. But um, uh, I see a big um, opening. I see a big hole in the literature, in the field of Armenian studies pertaining to Armenia, Soviet Armenia. And uh, because I was in Armenian studies before, uh, I mean, we, we learned about it in school. Um, and I basically had the luck to learn the language. Uh, I decided to go into that direction rather than studying the Armenian diaspora. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about your, how you got interested in, in, the, in right. the whole field, because I think that's an interesting story. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Um, I have been uh, basically born to uh, an Iraqi father and a Turkish mother. Uh, I was born and raised in uh, Istanbul. And uh, I somehow uh, ended up in an American school where the curriculum was much more um, open-minded, I want to say. Uh, in the mid-2000s, it was uh, okay to talk about uh, ethnic minorities in the Ottoman Empire and um, uh, the genocide itself. We had a course about, and then the Kurdish issue, the Turkish history, etc. Uh, our curriculum and history classes, uh, I majored in history, and our classes were uh, fairly uh, liberal in um, interpreting Turkish history. So um, I had that luck. And then I went out of the country and got educated. <laughs> and uh, that's how I basically furthered myself uh, in Armenian studies. It 
does exist. Actually, it's very popular in Armenia. Um, it's never referred to as Western Armenia. It's only referred to as Western Armenia when something political happens, something, you know, something that is necessary for a politician or uh, someone who is ordinary but needs to make a political statement, Western Armenia comes up. But the idea of ancestral home is definitely there. And um, we actually see this uh, in the post-1990s uh, folklore. When uh, folklore got revived in Armenia, it was mostly based on Ottoman Armenian folklore. It was not Russian Armenian or Iranian Armenian folklore, despite them being in uh, Armenia. Um, and the second thing that we see today is mostly roots tourism. Armenians uh, are traveling to Turkey, to their ancestral home. Um, and I travel with them often uh, to uh, basically figure out where they see, where they conceptualize the Erbil, because it's not in the neighborhoods where Kurds or Turks live, but it's rather pure um, and basically eternal places like mountains or um, churches, churches the, the, the sites that are basically religiously sacred or sites that are somehow secularly and nationally sacred, places like the Aigestan neighborhood in Van or Suluhi uh, Kamurch in uh, Mush or Geligizan uh, itself uh, is revered very much. So we see uh, a wave of young Armenians who have Ottoman background uh, and, and they're not a minority by the way. They're probably, half of the population has at least one Ottoman ancestor. Uh, it's wherever you go, whoever you talk, they'll tell you about their grandmother, grandfather, or both. Um, so we see that. And then the other thing is uh, people are interested in their ancestors. Since the 1990s, they started uh, creating, actively creating um, family trees. So those family trees are mostly rooted in the Ottoman world. And basically, wherever the town is, at the roots, <coughs> that is mentioned. So it's another way of actually remembering, writing down, recording the history uh, of, of Ottoman Armenian heritage. Over here and then here. Uh, you mentioned you went to an uh, American school, and uh, it was more open-minded. Uh, it is very difficult for me to understand how a school that is, uh, the curriculum is controlled by the government would allow your school to be open-minded and teach you about um, the wrongs of the Turkish uh, doings. Uh, can you explain that? Because as much as I know, that is not what is happening in Turkey. That's not what is happening right now. But if 10 years ago, this wasn't the case. Uh, first of all, 10 years ago, curriculums were not controlled by the government, uh, especially private schools in Turkey had their own right to put in their cu curriculum or not. Whatever they wanted to put, they could. Um, that changed, of course, with the appearance of the dictatorship, but um, that wasn't always the case. I mean, there were certain pockets where academics, young academics like me, uh, could find different sources of information. And uh, and a lot of those academics are out of Turkey now, of course, that's reflected um, in our lives as well. But it wasn't always like this. It's Please don't consider history as a statement. Uh, um, state. Yeah, state, absolutely. I mean, it fluctuates. There are times in Turkey where a liberal government comes in and promises good things, and then somehow does it. And then another wave comes in and completely disappears. That's the history of Turkey. Uh, may I? Yes. Uh, in 1995, I was in Istanbul, and we visited some Armenian schools, uh, the patriarchate, and uh, the stories that we were told that the career 
curriculum is controlled by the government. But that's um, an Armenian school, and it's high school. It's not university. Well, so there's a difference. Uh, of course. Because of the level? The, so the there's no control? It's the private universities, such as Bilgi University, Sabanja. Even normal universities, the government does not have a set curriculum for universities. Like Bosporus University, a graduate of Armenian studies from Michigan, Tolga Yashar Dora, he's there, he's teaching history classes. He's teaching about the Ottoman Armenians. How is that supposed to happen then? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's happening. And then Hayre will throw us out. Hayre Salam, I'm sorry. She asked, where did she learn Armenian? She said, I've learned it in Armenia. <laughs> I am not a Kurdish nationalist, a Turkish nationalist, an Armenian nationalist, because that space was inhabited by different nationals. The fact that it is Turkey now does not say much about Kurds, Armenians, who also inhabited the, the space. But the reason why I call it Anatolia rather than Eastern Turkey is because it's much more neutral than Western Armenia, Northern Kurdistan, or Eastern Turkey. I tried to avoid those terms. Thinking in national terms is not really working for me, that's why. Yeah. Other questions? Or? Yeah, go ahead. Say it louder, so then we'll repeat it too. Yeah. the believers in the Bolshevik system or simply uh, the ones who just didn't care or the voices of those who were not, that were not really heard as well as possible um, to s spot uh, such a thing would be very hard because if they don't care they won't write about it um, and we only can capture intellectuals so um, for this period, I'm sure there are, there were. Not, not every Armenian has to be genetically uh, <laughs> prepared to care about uh, uh, what it seems to be a homeland for them. Um, this by no means uh, to generalize the whole Ottoman Armenian population, but simply there, we don't have the means to understand uh, whether that's the case or not, whether we can check balance uh, the results. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Let's have a round of applause for him. Thank you. Again, I think it opens up our eyes a little bit to uh, some of the differences. Everything is not the same. And especially in, in Armenia, um, she was talking to me earlier, and it's something to remember again, as she mentioned, that uh, almost half of today's Armenia Back in 1918, 300,000 refugees had come to Armenia when Armenia, Russian Armenia, only had a population of about 350,000. So uh, we can see that our concepts of Western Armenian and Eastern Armenian seem so rigid, but actually there's crossover. And I have it in my language class where I have students who have a grandparent from uh, Russian Armenia and a parent from uh, Western Armenia. and we see the mixture and it's a very interesting uh, process. So thank you very much for the presentation. Please enjoy some coffee and cookies and uh, come up and uh, meet uh, Aisha Nur Korkmaz and uh, we'll see you November the 8th, Friday, November the 8th for Dr. Umid Kurt. Thank you very much, we'll see you. Thank you.